Hello and welcome to another episode of the Daily Remedy Podcast. Today we're here with Dr. David Lewis. Dr. Lewis is an anesthesiologist, pain management specialist, who, fortunately or unfortunately, is known for both his medical acumen and legal experience. He was acquitted for prescribing opioids without legitimate medical cause and insurance fraud after a grueling, highly publicized legal battle. We discuss his case and analyze lessons we can learn. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Lewis. Hello. How's everybody doing? Everybody's doing well and intrigued to learn about your story, Dr. Lewis. So for the audience, can you provide a timeline on your legal case from when the investigation began through the legal proceedings and eventual acquittal? Yeah, I sure can. Um, So this is kind of a twisted kind of story, but... uh, I started working at Pain Center USA in what would be November slash December of 2016. And then we were, we became under investigation. Um, we, they came and raided us on December, would have been December 8th of 2018. When we got the indictment, what was interesting to me about the indictment was um, that the, they said that this indictment started in January of 14, which was way before I was there. So it didn't involve me. So one of the things that really disturbed me about it was the fact that, you know, I'm involved in this indictment that, and they were already undergoing an active investigation into this practice almost, you know, almost three years before I had arrived. So I was kind of caught up in the web. So I get there November of 16. They've already had an investigation going since January of 13, 14. And then we get indicted in 18. And so uh, a lot of things happen from, from 18 to, to the end, but Really, the, the timeline of it starts for me in 18, and then, and, and it's a whole lot of things that's coming to me at one time, but one of the things that I want to caution everybody against is what happened to me. What happened to me is I get indicted, and all of my mentors, my professors, and everybody starts calling me and saying, look, this is the lawyer that you need. Call this person. Uh, you know, you need to get in contact with this person, all of that kind of stuff. The one thing that I want to stress to anybody in a situation like this is you have time. Like nothing is going to happen immediately. Nothing's happening right now. Okay. And I know, um, particularly for me, you know, I've never been in trouble a day in my life. I never, I mean, I never got in trouble for anything a day in my life. So this was all new to me. And so for the police to come knocking at your door, I mean, I literally had what you would, what you would see in a movie or hearing a rap song. Like I have police banging at my door six o'clock in the morning on a day I'm, you know, I'm getting ready to go to work. Um, I'm in the bathroom. Let's just say I was shaving, but I'm in the bathroom and, uh, you know, they're, when the police come like that, they're coming aggressively. So um, one of the things that happened, just because of where, where, how my house is positioned and everything and where my front door is, I have to walk past the alarm and the cameras to actually see before I get to the front door to see what's going on. And when I walk to the door, because the way that they were bamming on the door and how aggressive they were, when I got out of the bathroom, I immediately went to get my gun. And so when I get my gun, I'm going past <laughs> going past where the alarms are and I can see, oh, it's nothing but berries out here. So I take my gun, I put it up, and then I go to the front door. But the way that they, you know, they came very aggressively, uh, long guns, Kevlar, wow. you know, so I've never been in a situation like this at all. And I, I mean, it's, you know, what felt like 15, 20, 30, 30 cops out there coming to get me. So even the way that they approached was uh, extremely aggressive. 
and you and I've never been in a situation like this before. And so one of the things that happens is, you know, you're scared, you're anxious, you're nervous, and you don't know how to react, but you have time. And so what happened, I'm getting calls, and everybody's telling me, you know, you need this lawyer, that lawyer, this, this, this guy's good and all of that kind of stuff. And so I wound up, um, and, and, and my first lawyer is actually a, a great, great lawyer, and we've become friends throughout this entire process. One of the things that I, that I did recognize and learn, though, is you have time, do your due diligence, uh, because your resources are going to be limited, invest your resources wisely because, you know, they're going to, and I know we're going to get into this with some of the questions, but they play these games. Uh, the government plays games with you and they string you along. And part of the game, at least it feels like to me, is to kind of bleed you dry of your, your, your finances. And so they know you're in this situation, so you panic in and you start you know, spending, spending good money after bad money. And so one of the things that I that I wish I would have done, and I, I caution people against this, even that first lawyer, what you need to do is you need to find somebody who is the specialist in this field, who they know the lingo, they, they, they know the history, they have a proven track record, they've won, they know how to, they know how to maneuver in these spaces because one of the things that I've seen as a result of all of this is some of the pitfalls a lot of the other physicians have run into with some of these lawyers and not getting people who really know taking plea deals when they shouldn't, you know, things like that. So uh, that's one of the things that I wanted to caution people against while I had this space and opportunity. Um, so I get indicted. Um, I pick my first lawyer who was a good lawyer as well. The, the very well credential, great reputation, very well known. Uh, but what wound up happening is about three or four months into my case, I recognized the seriousness. I recognized the seriousness of it and the fact that I really would need, I'm going to need somebody that's a specialist. I'm going to need somebody that really, really knows this and knows what they're talking about, knows how to, you know, kind of kind of dance at the prom when it comes to stuff like this. So, and so I, uh, I got my second lawyer. And then from then, things kind of calmed down. But for about a, about a year later, we get hit with a, a civil case, which, which really for all intents and purposes turns into one of these kind of cash grab situations. We've heard about them where if you've ever used, you know, baby powder or something like that, and, it caused a rash or something, you could be entitled to, you know, thousands of dollars or, you know, compensation or something like that. So we get this whole pile of people who are, who've been done wrong, wrongfully for whatever reason. This mal, it's a civil malpractice case. So, so this happens about a year later. So we get hit with the civil suit, which, like I said, seems kind of like a cash grab to me. And then so, the next thing that happens is COVID. COVID happens, and then the world goes on pause. And, you know, they, we're just... It, it, and during that time, conveniently or, un, or unconveniently, uh, you know, we have issues getting discovery and all of that kind of stuff. So it's all of these games that they're playing. What is and discovery? So, discovery is... Oh, okay. So the discovery is part of the... Part of one of the things that if they accuse you, if you have allegations uh, for a federal indictment, one of the things that they have to do is tell you what they found, what they found and what they think. And that's called the discovery, what they discovered. So we had asked for the discovery, you know, in many, many occasions, in many different ways. They kind of played around with that, giving us a little bit at a time. Because this is what you have to build your, you know, one of the things that you have that you can build your defense on is the discovery. So kind of like not allowing us to really build a defense, build a good case, even though we already knew that we had a great case, you know, from the jump. But so we play this COVID game and then we finally wind up getting to trial 
which would amount to about three and a half years later. So from 18, wow. so from December of 18, I finally go to trial in May of May of 22, six, almost seven weeks of trial. And then, so it was, it was six defendants, two took pleas. One was a, um, turned out to be during trial, it was discovered that, uh, he was a bit of a whistleblower. So two of them took pleas. The other four went to trial and then we were acquitted of all 56 counts, which, uh, to include uh, Medicare, Medicaid fraud, um, unlicensed con controlled substance act violations, unlawful distribution of controlled substances, and then so those are those two charges, and then the conspiracy attached to them. So that conspiracy, uh, which was really the big charge, cons conspiracy to commit healthcare fraud, conspiracy to distribute. Uh, uncontrolled uh, uh, controlled substance you know those are 20 year uh sentences so those were the big deals that we were facing but the the good thing is that we were acquitted of all 56 counts wow 56 let's, to zero wow let's talk a little bit about the emotional impact it's for people who are not familiar with the government strategy, particularly the strategies that have emerged out of the hysteria around the opiate epidemic, three years to trial, six to seven week trial may seem like a long time. And as you and I both know, public sentiment is quick to point against the accused. And there's always oh, yeah. a sentiment that you must have done something this wouldn't have happened if you didn't do something. Talk sure. about that. So, yeah, let me speak to that. Um, something very real about that. So coming from this side of it, uh, I'm a black man from Detroit, and I already know that there are stereotypes and stigmas associated with me and people that look like me. And what I always wanted to do was be, I wanted to disassociate myself with anything like that. I'm the upstanding, straight and narrow, by the book guy. And so that was one of the things that I, I really didn't like about this entire process is that I'm the straight, clean guy, but yet still they, they did all of this to me. Um, the emotional impact, it's, it's difficult to even explain. It's kind of crazy because it almost feels like a dream that it didn't happen, but I know that it did. It's difficult to describe. The very first thing I'll say is this, I'm a son. I'm a father, I'm a nephew, I'm a cousin, I'm a, all of these, I'm somebody's doctor, I'm somebody's friend. So what happens immediately is that it impacts that whole circle. It impacts everybody. It's not just me. Yeah. So I wasn't, it, it, as daunting as this was, I did realize that this is something that I'm not necessarily in by myself, even though it's happening to me. It's happening to, you know, my father's a, a well-known pastor. His church was affected. He was affected. You know, this is pastor's son. You know, this, so then now his whole life has changed. My mother's a well-known businesswoman. You know, she's got a prominent business 20 plus years in the city of Detroit. Now this impacts her contracts that she can get, you know, um, things that I worried about is I didn't want my daughter to go to school and the kids at school see because what what wound up happening was they run that on the news cycle that was a, this was one of the biggest cases in Michigan history it was a 400 half a billion dollar case wow. so they ran it on the five in the morning six in the morning seven in the morning five at night six in the morning six at night seven seven eleven o'clock at night this is the top story on the news for almost probably a, for to be honest for about a week and they and they and it went on to other bits and pieces of it for about 2 weeks so this is like a 2 week nightmare public like public shame public humiliation so the emotional impact you know I can't even measure not just on myself but my family my friends everybody involved everybody that knows who Dr. Lewis is 
So it affects everybody. You know, this is a yeah. uh, this is a huge deal that I don't think if, if if you haven't gone through something like this, you couldn't imagine the type of impact that it would have. Yeah, it, it's difficult. And thank you for sharing that emotions. Let's sure. transition and talk a little bit about the legal strategies. Can you, without getting into too much of the nuances around, uh, you know, elemental essential frameworks and some of the jurisprudence, sure. just just at a very high level, can you talk a little bit about the legal strategy the government used? I know that they limited your assets, uh, but beyond that, what are the strategies at a high level that the government used, and what are the strategies yeah. that you use to counter that? So one of the things that they do is, of course, they're going to, the very first thing, and I didn't even realize this, is um, they freeze your money. Um, so when I was in the holding cell, they came and got me 6 o'clock in the morning. I get I get to jail is what it is. I get to jail. They release me about 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm back home. And then now it's, you know, let's get life together and let's figure out. I go to the bank, and that's when it immediately hits me how real this is. Okay, Because while I'm in the holding cell, I'm thinking, well, I just got paid. I got... You know, I got a little money and all that kind of stuff. I'll do this, this, and this. I'm trying to, you know, strategize and all of that kind of stuff on the front end. As soon as I get out, go to the bank, all your assets are frozen. Everything. You don't, you don't have money. So <clears throat> that was a big, that was one of the big things because immediately as you start thinking, I got to have money for a retainer, for a lawyer. So then now I don't have any money. So yeah, they, they, they freeze your money. And so what winds up happening is they freeze your money. Um, these are all the very real things that happen to me. They take your passports because you're a flight risk. They don't want you to leave. They take your weapons. So they took my guns, took my passport, froze my money. Um, and then uh, gave me gave me what really is essentially a probation officer, which they call a pretrial attorney. I mean, not attorney, but a pretrial officer. You be a pretrial officer that you have to check in with every month. You know, you got to see them. They have to come by your house, make sure that you. they treat you like a drug dealer. They they wanted to make sure that my house was an actual real house, that somebody actually lived in it, that I was still going to live in it. One of the things that they do is they limit it. Although they didn't restrict my uh, medical license or my DEA, they also, but they, what they tell me, which was, duplicitous is, okay, we're not going to limit your medical license or your DEA, but we don't want you to write any uh, narcotics or anything like that. We don't want you to write any controlled substances until all this is over. And so I can't get a job in medicine. They want you to work. They, they say, okay, we want you to be gainfully employed during this pretrial or probationary period until trial. We want you to be gainfully employed. You know you're a physician, but guess what? You're not going to be able to be a physician because you're uninsurable during this time because you got a health care fraud case pending against you to the tune of half a billion dollars. So they want you to work and you can't work. So they freeze your assets, tell you got to work, but you really can't work. So you have to scratch and, you know, scratch and scrape and try to figure out how to make ends meet. And and so these are some of the strategies. And 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 and, and I do want to want to point at one thing too, without getting into a whole bunch of nuances. Some of the things that the, the government did that I didn't particularly like at all was, and this came out in trial was was one of these things called their approach. One of these things, with these red flags. And so one of the reasons that they attacked us or came after us was things that I thought were just utterly ridiculous. Okay, so long waiting rooms, bit busy waiting rooms and crowded parking lots. The fact that my prescription database showed that I prescribed all of these narcotics and all of this kind of stuff. They use that stuff and they take that out of context. It was kind of like the government has this this playbook, this cookie cutter kind of playbook. And I was able to see this because I sat in on a case before my case. I sat in on my case and then I sat in on Dr. Pompey's case afterwards and the, it, it's this constant theme with at least the, those are the three that i can speak to intimately it was the same playbook they were do, they were using the same tactics in each of these to kind of make it say okay well if it looks like this then they must be all doing the same thing and that was one of the things that i didn't like uh, at all so 
the our approach to defend ourselves against that was we knew the playbook. We knew this, these are the plays. And, and so we had a strategy for each of the plays. But they, they, they have very, very weak grounds to stand on. Um, and I'll tell people, I'll defend this to the day I die. The practice that I was at was one of the best practices I've ever been at in my life. And I'm one of the people who I travel and practice. I did for six or seven years, I did what's called local tenants, where I would travel and be in different parts of the country, different regions. So I've seen different practice models and practice in different settings. So I know good practices, bad practices. I've practiced in bad practices that I can't wait to come. I'm here for a week or two weeks, but I can't wait to get out of here. I've been in places like that. This was not one of those places. And this is clearly a government overstep in a situation like this where they, they think this is this and this, and they didn't do their due diligence and they found out uh, through, you know, taxpayer resources and all of this kind of stuff after a seven-week trial that really we got all of this wrong. Did they acknowledge that they got it wrong? No, of course not. That, so, that has not been acknowledged at all. It, it, so the, and the interesting part about that is, just like I said, which was very real, they ran this story morning, noon, and night for almost two weeks, for about 10 days, the better part of about 10 about 10 days and then for us to be acquitted for that big of a deal that they made out of it because you know there's it's clips and all kind of stuff for, for as big a deal as they made out of it they gave us a, I think it was maybe six paragraphs I'm gonna say maybe six radio paragraphs. silence radio yep. silence they, they gave us six all paragraphs. about it and that was it. And they were just like, and 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 not as not even as much as a, oh, uh, you know what? We really, really got this bad. We 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 did something bad for these guys, and we we have to do better. Our education has to be better, um, and we apologize. I, I, that would have been that would have gone a long way. It would have yeah. done done anything about. Them lost wages and earning potential and all of that kind of stuff. But even just to acknowledge that, you know, you've ruined, you've ruined some of these doctors' lives. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll never be the same. We'll never be whole the way that we were whole before all of this happened. And especially in a situation where this should never have happened. Yeah. And that's and I was, the thing. Yeah, I was giving the silence marker because it's amazing how the media seems to uh, take um, a very different approach in acquittal versus uh, a different type of outcome. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship between the government and the media and patterns that you noticed between the legal strategy and then how things are portrayed in the media? Yeah, well, so again, like I keep saying this playbook. There are clearly these inflammatory words. They they know the words that kind of incite people. And, 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 and with media, especially now, there's this buzzwords, clickbait, all of this kind of stuff. They're trying to, you know, they're trying to get eyes on stories and trying to make it, you know, trying to make things be something that they may not be. And so the government, even in the language, it's, it's public record. I, you know, it's... It, 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 I just shake my head when I read the indictment now. The, the indictment is totally inflammatory. It's totally exaggerated, totally totally overblown. And then, so the government does that. And then the media, somehow or another, a sealed indictment gets leaked to some top journalist or somebody in the media, and then everybody gets it, and then now it's out. And so they're, they're playing this game. The government is kind of playing with the media knowing that well if i say this like this if i write it up in the indictment like this it gives the media it gives the the the, the, the screenshot it gives the, the the banner for the the top story at 11 o'clock you know 450 million dollar fraud doctor suspected of fraud rolls royce I, you know they i had a for whatever reason i don't even <laughs> And, and 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 I don't even mind sharing this because it came out in trial too. I have a Rolls Royce, I have a sixty five 
Silver Cloud Rolls Royce that I paid sixty grand for. It's not a million dollar car or anything. They made that such a big deal to make it seem like, okay, these doctors are greedy. They're just after money. The one doctor is a young black doctor. He drives a Rolls Royce and he wears fancy clothes, you know, all of this kind of stuff. And so they play that up. And and really what winds up happening is you really are guilty until you are proven innocent. And then even when you're proven innocent, you really can't wash that that feeling or the sentiment of guilt off of you that no. the, that the public has already in their mind they're like oh, okay well oh we knew it like i had this even happen with my friends so so one of the best things that happened to me during this case was the fact that this case happened um i had sandbox friends or, or at least people that i've known since the sandbox who i wouldn't have known weren't my true friends until something like this happened who they were like, Oh, I knew it. Oh, I, I knew he had to been doing something wrong all of this time. See, I knew it. He finally got caught. I never done nothing wrong a day of my life. I just, yeah. but, but, but the instant the media and the story and they push that narrative, the instant that comes out, it's hard to get, it's hard to get around that and, and to erase all of the, everything that comes along with it. So yeah, yeah, it was a totally difficult process. It was horrible. No, it's uh, I'm so sorry you had to go through that. In terms of preventative strategies, a compliance system, or some measure of oversight that you could have had in place, how would that have changed the outcome? And talk a little bit about some of the preventative measures, like a compliance plan that you could have incorporated to prevent some of the encroachment, if you will, on the government's part. Me, myself, specifically, because I was a I was a 1099 employee. So I don't know that there could have been anything that I could have done specifically myself with respect to compliance. But um, and not speaking for my owner, who was a it was a great man. <laughs> Dr. Bother is a great man. But uh, maybe there were some things that he could have done as far as compliance. But one of the things that I think we're hampered with is the fact that the government doesn't show their hand. Yeah. And they play a, to me, when it comes to, to doctors, uh, just the healthcare, healthcare professionals in general, the government plays a dirty hand, dirty game because while we can get all of the compliance measures and things like that, that we want and have those things in place, they go around that. So we, we already have checks and balances in medicine. So if I'm a bad doctor, I should be reviewed by the medical board first. Medical board should say, look, hey, we, we heard some stuff about you. It's been reports about you. Are you a bad doctor? We need to come check you out, maybe put you on probation, for a while, you know, whatever. There are steps of checks and balances. If you are overbilling for insurance, uh, Maybe you, you didn't do this right. Oh, this looks way wild out, outside of the, you know, the scope of a standard medical practice. This is all these buzz where the scope of a standard medical practice doesn't look right and all that kind of stuff. They can check and audit with the insurance providers and all of that kind of stuff and see, well, was this right? Or is, is he really outside? Or are these numbers really, you know, really too high? Or are they right in line? They don't do any of that based off of what they, what they think. They think, it, oh, okay, well, this is a big, busy practice, and it's a pain practice, or they must be doing something wrong. They're making all this money, and then they got this one guy, this one young black doctor. He comes in there. He drives a Rolls Royce. You know, they're drug dealers. And it's, and and I don't want to speak for them, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying that for emphasis, but that's how it felt. That's exactly yeah. how it felt when you went from a compliance end so that if or when – you are subjected to going to a trial or something like that, unfortunately, you at least have that as your defense and say, well, look, we have compliance measures in place. We, we get regular audits. We have, we have all of these things in place. It can't do anything but help you. So I can yeah. definitely see the benefits of having that as an, as an owner. Uh, you know, once I have my own practice, I would definitely make sure on the front end, because they're not going to tell you if you're under investigation, unfortunately. They're not going to give you any kind of warnings that, or at least in, in our case, they didn't give us any kind of warnings that the, 
that we were doing anything wrong or that we're looking at you. And so you just need to have those things in place. You got to have people in position to kind of be your eyes and ears for you. Yeah. It's a difficult, difficult situation. Now that you are um, in the clear, uh, what sort of changes will you make in how you practice? Are there certain decisions you might make differently, certain legal provisions you may take into account more carefully? Sure. Talk a little bit about your change in mindset. Well, again, because I don't have my own practice, I, I'm still going to, I'm, I'm still an employee. I'm still 1099. And so now when I, when I go to places, I interview and stuff like that. I make sure that they're well vetted. I have um, money and resources allocated for my own compliance. And I let them know I'm forthcoming with them and say, look, you know, I'm one of the, what is it, 0.3% that actually beat the federal government. Um, as big a deal as that is, that's nice. But, hey, let me make sure because I'm sure they don't, they don't like to lose. So maybe they're watching me. And if you hire me, hey, they may be watching you. So it, it, it's a good thing for me to bring my compliance team in here. Make sure that you're on the up and up, for not just for my safety, but for your safety as well. Um, yeah. Nobody wants, I, I don't want this to happen to anybody. This, especially especially when, it's, when it should never have happened. You know, this, this kind of thing should never have happened to us. I can't speak for everybody, but to us, this just shouldn't have happened. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Lewis. And remaining time that we have, I'd like to end with one question, and that is um, if you had one piece of advice that you could give to the federal government, to the DEA, just to kind of let them know the impact of what they're doing to physicians like yourself, uh, what would that be? That's a complicated question. So well, let me approach it like this, because you asked me what, what set of advice would I give them? Um, everybody has a different approach when it comes to this. I don't, as, as bad as all of this was, I don't hold any, I don't harbor any ill feelings towards the federal government. Um, and I, and I do want to take a, a, a moment to say this. Our process here is not the best. It's not the most perfect, but I went through the process and I thought it was fair. And I'm not just saying that because I'm on the winning side of it. I, I went through the whole thing, you know, the, the entire process of how it how it went. They try their best to be fair. It's difficult. One of the things that has to happen, I think, that really could help, because I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to do their job. All right. So I'm, I'm going to be respectful of my fellow man. You know, they're trying to do their job, make their money, feed their family, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's just a lack of education. But what the what the government and the, the lawmakers and everybody needs to do, they need to come to our side. They need to come to the medical side and understand what the practice of medicine truly is about. It's not. So, yeah, you're going to have people that practice at the margins and and push the limits and, and, and try to make more money than they should and all of that kind of stuff. But statistics show, you know, those numbers are extremely small compared with the large amount of doctors that are out here that are upstanding, just trying to make a living. They don't teach us business. They don't teach us law in medical school. They teach us medicine. So once we go out here, especially if you're not attached to an academic institution and you're out here in a private practice, you kind of out here on your own because you don't have you don't have a blueprint or a map to kind of navigate you through how do you how do you optimize making money how do you because it's a business so how do you make money how do you care for patients how do you do all of these things hit all of these marks be in compliance and all of that kind of stuff so it's education on both ends they don't teach us that in medical school i feel like they don't teach them the lawmakers and the government, those things about our profession. So I think really what has to happen is everybody needs to come to the tape um, in good faith and have real discussions as to what what the practice of medicine is. How does a how does this look? Because to the untrained eye, 
yeah, we had a big, busy boom in practice that was, you know, we probably had 25,000 patients, but we had six providers. We had ancillary help. We had all of the things in place to make that well or machine run. And if you don't know that, if you don't, if, if you've not worked in a in a pain clinic, if you don't know medicine intimately like that, it could look like something that is totally not. And it's just, it looks like that to you because you just don't have the training. And, and yeah. that's one of the things that, and this is not to try to extend the olive branch to the government that tried to put me away for 20 years. But the reality of it is that I see where their shortcomings are. Their shortcomings are in the lack of education. Now, yeah. what I don't know is, are they trying to play intentionally blind or are they trying to play stupid? Like, oh, we just don't know. If they know and they don't care. You know, okay, if, if that's the case, but I'm taking it as, well, maybe they really just don't know because if you did, this was a waste. If in our case, this is a waste of time and money and people's lives for something that should never have gone to trial. And I think if you if, if, if you were educated and knew that from a prose, prosecutor standpoint or from the government standpoint, you would have known like, okay, yeah, this is not, yeah, this one looks, this one kind of checks out. We probably shouldn't do this. Yeah. Yeah, no, well said. I thank you so much uh, for your time, sharing the insight. The emotions were there still a bit raw so i appreciate you sharing your story with that and i hope that we can stay in touch moving forward absolutely thank you for having me man anytime no you need me let me know we'll do